Breaking news out of Spartanburg. The Citadel Bulldogs win. We are back here on Citadel Gray Line. I am your host, John Rawl. Jeff Hartzell is standing by. He'll come on to talk about the thrilling come from behind victory at Gibbs Stadium. We'll have him on in just a few minutes as the Citadel picks up its first win on the football schedule for spring 2021. We are the show that covers everything Citadel related, the good, the bad, including all those losses that uh, Brent Thompson's team has unfortunately been suffering here as of late. And we cover sports. We cover what's going on in the area code that is Moultrie Street, Charleston, South Carolina. And we also do alumni spotlights. And we also like to have a little fun when we're able to. And on this week's show, before Jeff comes on in just a few minutes, we're going to have fun right now. And we encourage you, if you'd like to be part of the fun, to reach out to our guest. If you have a question or comment, all you have to do is text us at 843-779-8496 and you'll be able to ask a question about sports. But also, you might have something to ask our guest who is a member of the class of 1985. And before I bring on this guest, we have to actually answer our trivia question, which I can't believe this thing did not get answered last week. Our trivia question was who this guest is that's about to join us. The trivia question was, name this former Citadel wrestler. That was one clue. And the second clue was, I think I'm right on this, this guest was the last Citadel alumnus to be elected to statewide office in the great state of South Carolina And you're not going to believe it, but we didn't have a correct answer. So we're going to have a double question here this week, our knob knowledge. And it all goes into Citadel Wrestling because this person that none of y'all could guess is on with us right now to talk about his amazing career at the Citadel Wrestling and as a great cadet, a perfect cadet, by the way, kind of like Robert E. Lee at West Point. And he's on to talk about that and so much more. And he's one of the Citadel's most famous alumni. It is this guy right here that nobody could guess on the trivia question. Here it is, the big unveil. Who are you, sir? I'm Thomas Ravenel, and if we're going to adhere to the honor code, I'm going to have to correct you and inform you that I was not a perfect cadet. (laughs) I did walk my share of tours, and I do not want to mislead uh, the, the listeners or the viewers, particularly those who actually went to school with me back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. We are... I don't know if anyone remembers Betty White, but um, I was in her office, Colonel Dick's office, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Somehow I just, I don't know if you're telling the truth there. You, you, you must have been the perfect cadet. Thomas, thank you for coming on. I can't believe no one guessed last week that you were a wrestler turned statewide elected officer, although for a very brief time. Right. But we're, we're, here we are today with you, Thomas Ravenel, again, class of 1985. And, of course, you've got that low country connection. Your father, a longtime congressman, the Ravenel Bridge. Your father just had a birthday last week. How's he doing? He's great. He's 94, and I, as I pointed out to him, I said, Dad, you're 94, but you have just um, entered your 95th year. Ah. And he's still very quick of mind. Uh, he's still the funniest man I know. And when he finally passes, he will probably, you know, now that Fritz Hollings has died, another Citadel man, you know, I, I don't know that there'll be any true characters left in South Carolina because he, he well, one of a kind. He is a character. And uh, I put it on Facebook, but he, he was giving a speech just a couple of years ago. I think it was 92. And somebody was asking about the bridge, and, and you know, for which they named, uh, at the time, it was the largest freestanding bridge in the world. I think it's been eclipsed by another bridge, but it was the largest freestanding uh, bridge. And they, he said, everybody loves the bridge. Ha- uh, no complaints about the bridge, but, you know, they had to make it a little bit taller to accommodate all these ships coming in especially with the expansion down there, you know, um, uh, uh, these new ships coming through the, um, you know, between um, middle and uh, middle America, between South and uh, North America, uh, the Panama Canal, excuse me. There you go. So, <laughs> so he got one complaint. 
He said, yeah, everyone loves the bridge. And a gentleman called him and said, my wife has complained about the bridge. And he said, well, what's the complaint? He said, well, you know, she thinks the bridge is a little steep and it makes her nervous to drive over it. So here he is, he's giving a speech and he's uh, pointing out this single complaint and he and his response, which I thought was quite humorous, especially at age 92, he, he said, well, uh, sir, yeah, he's, he's a consummate gentleman too. He said, I would like you to tell that lady, that dear lady, for her and just for her, I'm gonna go crank it down 35 feet. <laughs> well, whoever that person was, Obviously, did not ever go across the Grace Bridge and uh, whatever the other one was, the original bridge across over to Mount Pleasant. You talk about a thrill ride. The Ravenel Bridge is... Uh, well, they called the other bridge the New Bridge, which oh, yeah. was old. And then the Grace Bridge was one that was built, I think, in 1927, which I, incidentally was the year my father was born. But, you know, what's crazy. My father, you know, he's... Evidently, he's preparing to meet his maker because he's given me a lot of his stuff. And what he did, when evidently, when the bridge was complete, they gave him the old plans of the Grace Memorial Bridge. Hmm. And it's this long, rectangular piece of artwork. It's beautiful. And he gave it to me. It's the old blueprint. So I'm using it as a piece of artwork, and I put it in my home office above, um, you know, I watch a lot of... Um, CNBC. Um, you watch a lot of reality uh, television. Business. I watch a lot of business stuff on on um, CNBC. You know Kramer and what I use it, but I have it on top of the big flat screen TV. But um, so they've given him a lot of stuff, and I luckily have been the beneficiary of that. All right. Well, just because we're in your virtually in your great office there, are you located in Mount Pleasant? I am in Mount Pleasant. Okay. Exactly. In fact, I live right near here. I'm in the old village. Okay. Mount Pleasant, which is that area between Shim Creek going all the way up before you um, cross over into Sullivan's Island. That whole area to the uh, west of Coleman and Ben Sawyer Boulevard, it, it goes from Coleman to Ben. That, that's all called the old village. Hmm. And Governor Edwards lived there. He, he recently died. You know, it's, it's a um, really hot spot to be right now. And um, a lot of people are going in there and, and they're buying homes and they're tearing them down. And it's, um, but I'm getting ready to move. I'm going to move up to Aiken. No way. A, a Ravenel has to stay in Charleston now. <laughs> well, it doesn't have Ravenels here. Okay. And I'm in the process of renovating a house. It's called the balcony. And um, I didn't know this at the time, but the Knox family owned it. And their first cousins with the Woolworths. And, and they were like the, the Walmarts or the, the walls of their time. They owned the Woolworths. And it was their summer cottage because Aiken was a big uh, equestrian community. It was like Florida back 100 years ago during the Roaring Twenties. And my contractor went and took a look at the house and he said, he owned this house? I said, well, the Knox family. He said, that makes sense because it's built like Fort Knox. Hmm. And I got a pretty good price on it. He said, you couldn't build this house, you know, with the, the level of detail and workmanship. The, it, Ten times what you paid for it. So I thought I'd spend 120 days renovating it. And, yeah, it's in the paper, you know, I had to move in. But it's been like a year now. So we're getting that, that house in really good shape. And, Thomas, you just mentioned that you've got a, a, a house in Aiken, South Carolina. Now, I don't want to embarrass you here, but I don't think this is your run-of-the-mill house there in Aiken County. I thought I saw a price tag on this thing of nearly $2 million. Am I right on that? Yeah, but, you know, if the house were in Charleston, it would have been $10 million. Okay. You know, so it's six acres in the town of Aiken. It's, it's ridiculous, you know, you know, ridiculously low price. And the mm -hmm. funny part about it was um, at the time I was I was living downtown, but I, I got a couple of kids. I didn't start having kids until I was in my 50s. And my nanny said, you have to get out of downtown Charleston. You need to be in a kid-friendly neighborhood. So I moved over to Daniel Island. But I never figured this out. But the mover figured this joke out. And um, he's like, okay, where are you moving from and to? And I said, well, I'm at 74 Woodford. 
which is the name of a really good bourbon. And I'm going to 836 Whiskey Road. <laughs> <laughs> he, he quickly picked up on it. And here I am, you know, I got an MBA and all. It's like, wow, <laughs> this guy probably didn't have a high school education. And he was a little bit quicker than I was on that day. <laughs> I went from uh, a bourbon to a whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. Of course, if you know anything about Thomas Ravenel, you, I mean, I'm not picking on you here. This is just kind of the yeah. the, the way your life's per- turned out. It, it sounds like you've had a few parties in your life. Yeah. You know, I like to, um, you know, and, and, and it's a dominant gene, you know, the Ravenels, you know, we like to socialize. We're, we're, we're a gregarious clan. We, um, you know, we'll have a drink here and there, you know, it's a social lubricant so long as you don't, you know, abuse it. I'm going through a custody battle, so it's rare that I, I drink now at all. But, right. um, you know, because I had the kids full time. And in the court order, it says you can never be under the influence of alcohol. And I don't really know what that means, but, you know, I'm not going to, you know, dare go into a, a restaurant and order a drink. And then have someone snap a picture and then send it to somebody. And then, oh, he's out drinking with his kids. or So I just decided it's not even worth it, you know. I understand. Now, I will ask, since we know in 2006, 2007 time period, you went to jail for a, a certain amount of months for cocaine. Did you did you use illegal drugs as a Citadel cadet? No, no. What happened with that, that you know, that was... 99.9% before I even got in the office. Okay. I think I did it like one time when I was in office. And they told me later if I just kept my mouth shut, but you know, I'm so forthcoming. Maybe that's something um, I was too honest to a fault. Maybe I picked that up at the Citadel that they told me <laughs> if I just kept my mouth shut, nothing would have happened. Yeah. And then the other thing was that um, it should have been uh, kept in uh, state court. In which case, I would have been able to stay in office. It would have been a misdemeanor. And, but they said because I was the treasurer and I was writing 80,000 checks a week, many of which went to law enforcement, there was a conflict of interest. So they kicked it into federal court. You follow me? Yeah. And so because of the conflict of interest. And that's where they have all these mandatory minimums. And I, I was kept running my mouth and saying, well, did you ever buy it? And, and um and share and i go well you know i never want you know i don't want to mention any names but you know i shared it with some, yeah i shared it with this person or whatever no one else got in trouble in, in fact the naacp got involved and they said look we want to make sure that this rich white guy gets the same sentence as the poor black guy mm-hmm. but reginald uh uh he was the u.s attorney uh reginald floyd or lloyd yeah, you know, he ended up getting promoted because of this to uh, head of DHAC. He said they should be treated equally. They needed to be treated fairly. One guy's a dealer. The other guy was just a customer. And um, But the NAACP got involved. And I got a worse sentence than the dealer. Even though <laughs> he had probably a thousand other customers. Nothing happened to anybody else. And they came after me. And then... They said, just cooperate, you're going to get all these downward departures. And I said, well, what if I don't get them? They said, well, that'd be unprecedented, totally unprecedented, uh, that the judge, he always grants these uh, downward departures that are recommended by the prosecution. And then I read what's called a pretrial interview. And they said this woman had been in my house 35 times and seen me buy cocaine 35 times. I said, this girl's been in my house maybe once or twice. And they said, what if they, the judge reads this out loud? That would be unprecedented. That would never happen. Well, guess what? On both occasions, the precedent was broken. And I got a worse sentence than the drug dealer. It was, it was, it was really absurd. Yeah. And they came at me and said, you know, we're gonna get. We're gonna go after you for twenty years. And my lawyer said it's the United States government against Thomas Ravenel, and they have a ninety-nine percent conviction rate. So you you have to play ball. But early on in the process, um, 
the FBI called me and said, look, get your attorney to call the U.S. attorney. And he didn't. And I saw the guy later in public. He said, had you done what I told you to, uh, they would have negotiated it down to a plea agreement. But once they indicted you, they couldn't do that. But yeah. the reason I didn't do that was because I kept talking to this guy at SLED and they evidently wanted to nail me. But I think this all started was when I got elected, I became you know, a swing vote on the budget and control board. And, you know, at the time, there was a guy that had a slush fund. The most powerful guy in the state is the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Because when they wrote the Constitution, they wanted to ensure that were a black man elected, that he had no power. So they, all the power was vested with the uh, Senate Finance Chairman. And he had this slush fund that was costing $40 million. And I think it was just buying votes. And so he would basically... Um, to give an appearance of, of uh, checks and balances, the chairman of the budget and control board would have to sign off. Well, he's a guy, you know, as, as being the treasurer, I was a member of this five member board. So they had two votes that went with the governor and then there were two votes that went with the Democrats. And so Grady Patterson went with the Democrats. So when I went in there, I started going with the governor and they wanted to replace this guy was Sanford's uh, lawyer, and his name was Henry White. All I remember was his name was Henry White, but he was black. <laughs> nice guy. And so we installed him. But right before we did that, and the guy that was signing off on all these little checks, is, you know, they would say, okay, vote this way, and you'll get this check. And then he would present a check to the local fire station. And um, so they're basically using it to buy checks. It was a slush fund. And yeah. I basically replace this guy because Sanford told me what was going on. It was a big scandal. And so we got rid of this guy, Fusco, and they put in this guy, Henry White. But before that happened, Bernie Maybank set up a meeting with um, Leatherman, who's chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. And he said, um, and I remember he brought in a couple of bourbons. I was like, wow, these things are strong. And, and he goes, look, we can't have, I know that they're trying to put in this, the governor's guy, we can't have that. And I said, well, I've already made a commitment to the government that we are going to replace with Henry White, uh, Fusco. And I remember his face turned beet purple and he got up and left the table. And then right after all this, I got indicted. And Henry White saw the writing on the wall. He resigned. And then um, Fusco was quickly reinstalled as the executive director of the Budget and Control Board. And then the legislature put in a guy that would just rubber stamp, you know, um, the way it was when Grady was in there. So, you know, I'm not pointing fingers. You know, it was against the law. I should never have done it, you know. And it, But I think that, you know, you know, there are some benefits. I'm sure Trump would say this too. Uh, from working your way up in the politics. Because in business, everything's about telling the truth, being honest, never lying. And I thought I was just talking to people. We were all on the same team. We all work for the government, but that's not the case. Right. You know, these people want to nail you so they can have a, uh, you know, feather in their cap and move up. You know, like Reggie Lloyd got a, promote, got a big promotion out of all this. But, you know, they, you know, um, yeah, if I just kept my mouth shut and the guy told me when it was all over, Mark Moore, he was the prosecutor. He said, I remember we sat in Bart Daniels' office. He said, I'm Thomas Ravenel. You're the prosecutor. No matter what you ask me, here's your answer. Here's Thomas Ravenel's answer. I'm not answering the question. Have you done <laughs> that? Nothing would have happened. Nothing. Oh, well, I hate that. But instead... You know, I got a diary of the man. I'm like real forthcoming. I want to be honest about it. Yeah, I did this in high school. I tried this one time and, you know, and and then whatever I did, they just multiplied it by 10 or something. You know, it's like ridiculous. Like this girl was in my house 32 times. They didn't even have my name spelled right in the uh, pre-trial interview. So I got 10 months and a quarter million dollar fine. The other guy got the 10 months. And I also had to pay $300,000 for my lawyers. He got a, a public defender and he didn't get a big quarter million dollar fine. He mm -hmm. got like a hundred dollar fine. And, um, but 
they had this rule that after six months, in the last six months, you can apply to get in the halfway house. So after four months, I made application because it was 10 months. And so I only stayed in there for like six months. And, it, and this was like a camp. And they, and they had, um, it, there were no bars or rails or walls. All the doors were unlocked. And they said, look, um, and it was a part of a big campus. But we were in this place, it was a camp where people may come in as, you know, really bad people and they and they get from maximum security. Then the last six months they're in what's called a camp and they don't want to risk anything because they just want to get out. But they told us, said, look, you can leave, you can you can sneak away, but you know what? We'll find you and when you when we get you when we find you, you're going to and he pointed over to another um because they had like a medium security basement. You're going over there, and we're going to add 10 years to your sentence. But, you know, they would do these counts like every four hours. And a lot of guys would take chances, and they'd have their girlfriends pick them up, and they'd go to a hotel. And But, you know, I never took any of those chances. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to get out of there. It was, but, you know, I'll tell you what. The first year of the Citadel was 10 times worse than, you know, being at this camp. But, um, well, I know, wanted to add, I wanted to ask you. Terrible. You know, I just tried to do the right thing. I should have never done the the cocaine, you know, I never partied at all. You know, I made a lot of money. I worked all the time and then I ran for the U S Senate and then there was nothing to do. Cause that's basically given up a lot of my business and I was kind of a listless time for me. And, and, um, you know, I got in with some of the wrong people and I was kind of a party pooper. I would go out uh, like bars and say, well, I'm tired. I'm gonna go in. And I remember this one guy, he, um, he was a French guy and he said, you know, he, he called it poudre, which is powder. He said, you know, if you're tired, do this. And I would go in there and then next thing you know, you know, it sort of escalated from there. Yeah. And then once I became treasurer, it, I, I just stopped and I may have done it maybe once or twice, you know, just very, very infrequently. And, but, you know, once I cut off, once I cut off that, um, once we replaced that guy, it was over. I mean, they wanted me out of there. So, you know, I should have been, I didn't realize how much power that job had because the um, budget control board runs the state the half year that the legislature is not in, um, is not in session. So we have, and, and for example, you know, um, there are like 80 state agencies. The Citadel is a state agency. Any any entity that receives money, state money, is a state agency. So the Citadel and anything, any money that they spend over two hundred fifty thousand dollars, they needed my approval. Uh -huh. And so a lot of you know the, the presidents of all these different um, colleges would come in and and, and um, hat in hand, pay homage, say hello, you know, be really polite and. And so I met a lot of people and then we were involved also on the investment commission. And, you know, one thing Grady did was instead of appointing someone like the governor can appoint somebody to be on the commission, but as a treasurer, you can sit on it yourself. So I sat on it and, and cause I, you know, I had an MBA, I had advanced training in finance and banking and investments. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't think I really realized how, powerful and and um how much fun i could have had you know being the state trainer because it you know i talk to curtis all the time and you know he, he loves it it's, it's a great job it comes with a lot of responsibility and um i was constantly you know when we were voting on things constantly doing my research i was constantly advocating on behalf of the taxpayer and it, you know i just yeah i, I really screwed up and i didn't I've paid for it. Yeah. Really. But life goes but, on. But and that notwithstanding, you know, I remember my lawyer told me, now that you are a convicted felon, you have a target on your back. Every little thing, they're going to come after you because of this. You know, normally 99% of the time, they'll just dis dismiss it. Nothing will happen. But because of this, you mm -hmm. know, you have to be extra squeaky clean. And I, and I should have paid more attention to that, especially when I got on the Southern Charm show, because, I mean, they, they were really looking to just get me. And I was a target. And it didn't matter. You yeah. know, if somebody made some outlandish charge against me, 
They weren't even going to investigate. They weren't going to release me. They didn't care what the facts were. And so, I, you know, I'm not going to get into all that, but, you know, it's, it's been a, a huge experience. And I just wanted to sort of keep a low profile and focus in on um, doing well in business and, um, you yeah, know, raising my kids right. That's why I'm moving to Aiken. That's right. And again, you've done very well in business. You are a commercial developer. And I want to talk about that in just a second. But you also, prior to getting into that business, you were a Citadel cadet and a wrestler. And in terms of wrestling here on the gray line, we are visiting with Thomas Ravenel, class of 85. Jeff Hartzell, our sports correspondent from the Post Courier, is going to be on just a second to talk about the Bulldogs' big win against the Walford Terriers last week. And Berman, the arch rival from the upstate, comes south here this week. We'll talk to Jeff about that in a moment, but we're continuing on with Thomas Ravenel. And I wanted to, because Thomas was a wrestler at the Citadel, we wanted to ask a knob knowledge question that somebody out there maybe will have better luck this week. We getting Nobody guessed Thomas Ravenel last week. Shame on all y'all. But we have redemption did, here I, this week. In, in fairness to these people, when I tell people, when they ask me where I went to college, I they don't believe it when I tell them I went to the Citadel, just, I guess, given my illustrious past. Hey, hey Thomas, I don't I don't yeah. believe it. Pro- prove it. Yeah, so I, I have to show them that. I, I know, I, that's I, what I'm talking about. There, as unbelievable as it may seem, I did get to the Citadel. Spin your know, camera around and show us. Great semesters. I hated it so much. I wanted to make sure it was not prolonged any more than it was. Thomas, I saw this before we got started. Why don't you spin the camera around and show us that beautiful diploma? Okay. Here we go, right here. Look at there. And then right about that, that's where I got my MBA. All and right. That's, uh, when I was state treasurer. And this three. Is the stuff. You know, we're getting ready to move up to the Aiken House. Yeah. And, uh, Okay. Well, so, three great accomplishments, story. of course. Being a Citadel alumnus is, is an amazing accomplishment. You went and got your MBA at the University of South Carolina, and and then you were a statewide elected official. You beat a guy, I think, who had been a nine-term incumbent or something like that. Uh, you know, he had served non-consecutively because the guy that was the um, – I, I can't remember his name. Um, well, you, you did a great job being elected statewide. The last Citadel alumnus lost, to do that. Then he regained the position in 98, but prior to that, he'd served maybe four or five. He'd probably served a total of maybe eight terms. So that's 32 mm-hmm. years. But, you know, Ekstrom beat him, and he was Comptroller General. I see. And he uh, he was Comptroller General and ran, became Treasurer, and then lost, and then ran for uh, Comptroller General again. And now he's the current Comptroller General, and he also sits on the Budget and Control Board, which I think they've eliminated. I see. I call well, it the five-headed monster. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go back to wrestling here, if, if you don't mind. And maybe we'll get you to do a wrestling move before we get out of here with you. <laughs> Our trivia question this week, Thomas, you can't answer this, is tell me – which two years the Citadel Wrestling Program won a Southern Conference Championship? If you could tell me that, text 843-779-8496. Again, the Citadel's won two SOCON titles in wrestling. Let me know which two years those were. Also, because we didn't have a winner last week, we're going to have a double knob knowledge question courtesy of Big Red Store. And that question, also involving the wrestling program, the Citadel has put forward four wrestlers who've kind of been considered wrestling All-Americans. And these four wrestlers, two are from one country and two are from another country. Tell me which two countries these Citadel wrestlers are from, and you'll get a $25 gift certificate courtesy of Big Red Store, which has hundreds of of great Citadel branded items for you to choose. And we will give you that $25 gift certificate. All you have to do, text your guest to 843-779-8496. And as we mentioned, this guy right here, Thomas Ravnell, a wrestler at the Citadel. What was that like that in the early eighties to be a college wrestler? You know, I had this anticipation that it was going to be really tough. I didn't wrestle my senior year in high school as I tore my knee 
playing football. But when I arrived at the Citadel my freshman year, I um, ended up beating out a guy that started. He was a junior, and he had started, you know, all three years, uh, his first two years. And he was a state champ from Georgia, so I beat him out. And my very first tournament, you know, is, uh, I won the tournament. And so I was – little impressed with myself felt good about myself but then you know the problems that i had with my my left knee because of um the damage i did to it and uh i don't know if you remember uh, ek wallace he did the surgery he was the orthopedist that worked for the citadel and that was the team doctor he did the operation it, it just it was constantly giving me problems so i, I did wrestle all four years but two of those years I, I had to quit like in the middle of the year just because of the problems associated with the knee. But, you know, having allowed the knee to just, you know, just having left it alone for an entire year, I, I did really well my my freshman year. That was probably my best year. Ah, which also and would I, have been your I, knob I, year. Because, you know, it, you traveled a lot and, uh, you know, you, you got to escape you know, all the drudgery of the Citadel life, for example, being a member of course squad, you didn't have to do a lot of the things that knobs do. You ate at the course squad tables. So you didn't have to sit down and brace and, and, um, <laughs> while you're eating. I mean, there are a lot of things you, you got away with. Uh, for example, if you had to walk tours or whatever, because you're on course squad, you know, you could postpone it, you know, um, Sometimes you just postpone it till summer, and then you could work work it off with Shorty. There was a guy named Shorty from South Africa. You just go to the warehouse and work them off with him. But um, you know, I think um, the thing about any sport is it's a matter of improving. I mean, for example, when I got to the Citadel, there were four times state champs, and you would think, "Oh my goodness, they're going to just destroy everybody," but they never got any better. And they didn't even have a 500 win streak their freshman year or their sophomore year. And they got sort of getting worse. And then you'd have guys that were like third in state and they would walk on. And by the time the senior year rolled around, they were going to nationals. Hmm. And they would have, you know, like a 90% victory streak. And I remember this one guy, Mitch Fuller. I'm telling you, what, if there were five years in college, he would have been a national champ because that guy – he was third in state his senior year, and he came in from Fort Johnson. There was another guy who was a four-time state champ. And by the time he was a senior, he was by far our best wrestler. And had there been one more year, he would have been, he would have been a national. He would have gone to the Olympics. Golly. And it just shows you, you know, it's all about improving, improving your game and not, you know, resting on your laurels and saying, okay, I'm a four-time state champ. I don't need anything to prove it. No, keep working hard, hard work, you know, persistence, you know, a constant desire to improve oneself. It, it really does pay off. What was your weight class? I wrestled 177, and then sometimes I'd wrestle 190 if I didn't feel like making weight, <laughs> especially around, um, you know, Christmas time. I remember one time I beat out this guy, Robert Wyndham, for the 177 class. But then when we returned from the holidays, I said, I think I'll wrestle 190. And then he ended up being in the better weight class, winning uh, the Southern Conference and going to the national championship. And But he was at the weight class that I beat him at. Hmm. If I would have just stayed there, you know, perhaps my chances were, I'm not saying I would have been as fortunate, but um, I think my odds would have been better, done better that year. There All right, Thomas. Really what, guy, I think you, from you. Hey, pardon me. I was going to ask. We we know about your wrestling prowess, but also you mentioned earlier you spent some time in Harvey Dick's office. That's the commandant's office at the Citadel. So it sounds like you did have a few tours you had to walk. So what was up with you and discipline there as a Citadel cadet? You know, it, it was you know the whole process to me even though my brother's a lot older he, he graduated in 72 we were both in N company i graduated in 85. I, I don't think i was really prepared you know my parents got divorced when i was young and i didn't have a lot of discipline growing up and and i you know in high school i was captain of the football wrestling teams and, and i sort of went from being 
you know, this heralded athlete, um, you know, popular guy, and to being immediately reduced to the lowliest vermin on the face of the earth. And I was just sort of, you know, it was like uh, shell-shocked or, you know, PTSD. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And um, and there were just a lot of rules, a lot of regulation. And, and the, a lot of these guys that were at the Citadel, you know, they, they went to Macaulay. They, they'd gone to military high schools. And this is something they wanted to do. This is something that my father said, look, you have a, two choices. VMI or the Citadel. <laughs> and then he came back and said, no, now you have one choice, the Citadel or the Citadel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it, I was a little, I, I didn't really want to go there to begin with. And I remember he sent me a letter said, okay, if you, you know, if you uh, get kicked out or if you quit or if you, if something happens, this is your alternative. And I remember he had, um, cut out this article and it's all about basic training at Paris Island. This is where you're going. Of course, I didn't read it. I just like threw it in the trying I was furious. <laughs> but it is strengthened my resolve to, you know, get through it. Well, you got through it all right, graduating in 1985 and then on to MBA and business. And you've been a successful commercial developer. You've got a presence in the low country. You have spread into the volunteer state. Give us an idea of what Ravenel's construction or development company, what you do there. Well, I'm a developer. I hire general contractors okay. and, you know, sort of that uh, building and developing, uh, I would hire general contractors. Uh, I did about 50 advanced auto parts and then I moved into doing a lot of food lines, probably did 25, you know, grocery anchored centers and then by Lowe's, Lowe's food stores. Um, you know, I ended up doing other type of tenants like staples. I mean, there are a number of different type tenants that I would do freestanding or they would be part of a shopping center. Like I did a big Walmart in Monk's Corner and I, and I found out from the mother of my children, oh, we call that our mall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says about Monk's Corner, but I built, you know, a big, um, well, actually I put the deal together and I flipped, you know, 25 acres to Walmart and they did a big super Walmart and I did all the tag alongs that go with the Walmart and we had about 10 out parcels. And I'll never forget, I was only a 65% owner of the entity and to show you what an honest person I am, before it became announced, there was an out parcel and I could have bought it on my own, but I didn't, I bought it through the entity that was developing the Walmart where I'd only get reap 60% of the profit. I had that entity buy it with my money so they could share it. what I did was because, and I asked a friend of mine, he said, yeah, I want to buy it. It's, um, but the guy wants 375 and I keep trying to get it for 350. I said, well, you wouldn't mind if I bought it, would you? And he said, no, you know, he'll sell it to you, you know, for whatever. So I called the guy and he said, um, 375. I said, when can we close? And so I closed like in five days and about two months later, and this is right after I ran for the U.S. Senate. And I remember I, I brought in my my uh, campaign manager as a broker and I, she needed to make her fee. And I told him I want to net a million dollars. So they had to pay a million thirty. And so I bought the land for three seventy five just because of the big announcement of the Walmart. You know, everything became very, very valuable. So but um, I didn't do that on my own. I did it. You know, through the partnership because I, I felt like they should share in that. And um, so I've, I've done a num number of deals like that. Right now I'm doing a 228 unit multifamily project in uh, Farragut, which is just about 20 miles due east of Knoxville. You may have heard that name Farragut, named for uh, Admiral Farragut. And Tennessee was a border state and he stayed with the union and he was famous. And it's also the city, the city's motto Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Although back then, the torpedoes didn't have little propellers. They were just kind of like <laughs> landmines. <laughs> but I, I think they need to change their motto that, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed backwards because it's so impossible to get anything permitted. You know, it's, it's probably, you know, the 85 deals I've done in 10 different states, it's probably the hardest area to get anything permitted. I and mean, they're very, very sticklers for everything. Yeah, 
Well, you, you're very involved with that. In fact, your and website. Then nine, that's 228 units. And then next year, we're going to do about 80,000 square foot retail development. So we got a retail component and a multifamily component uh, side by side. So that's what I'm working on now. Thomas, if people want to reach out to you for potential business for uh, maybe developing something, what is the best way for them to learn more about what you're doing? I do have a website. I haven't updated it in probably 25 years, but it's uh, Ravenel Develop. And it's with a P. Ravenel Develop dot com. Okay. And that's, that has my office number. And, um, you know, if anyone sends an email, I have uh, a secretary, she'll forward it to me. But normally when I'm doing developments, you know, I'm, I'm working with like a big anchor tenant. Okay. You know, like, like there's a number of them. So, um, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a development or, or build a suit for it. I'm, some some mom, mom and pop, unless it was anchored by a big, like, for example, in uh, Tennessee, there's Food City, it's 54,000 square feet, and we're going to do about 23,000 feet of shops. That's kind of spec, because we know we'll bring in the shops, and there's a lot of pent-up demand for that. But the big draw is is having that, um, you know, that 54, 406,000 square foot Food City, which is sort of an independent, and it's kind of like Piggly Wiggly was in this local area. It's, it's very popular, and the t- it's, it's owned by KBAT, it's, which is Kentucky, Virginia, um, Tennessee, and they're also in Georgia. And they and they only build about seven or eight stores a year. Well, you're very busy with that, but yeah. we're, I don't think you're quite as busy playing Thomas Ravenel on reality television. Tell me about no. what's going on with that in Southern Charm. You know, my you know, they say they fired me. My, my family did an intervention, and they told me, and I've got I'm the youngest of six kids. Three sisters and two brothers, my mom and dad, they said if I return to Southern Charm, they were going to disown me. Because, you know, people say, well, you know, you did all this crazy stuff, but, you know, I know people are going to laugh, but being a man of integrity, I wanted to get the ratings. I was just trying to do what I thought they wanted to do and increase the ratings and, and do some, you know, some fun stuff. But, you know, a lot of that came back to hurt me. And I had some uh, issues with, you know, uh, I don't want to get into it with some people on the show. And, you know, this one person that ran a, a, a fan site of another cast member whom yeah. I jilted. And, and they waged a social media campaign. And it was, it got really nasty. And, 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 you, and when you're dealing on this, a show like this, which is, broadcast internationally, um, it can get really nasty. And so it was just better just to just get out. I know there's been I a mean, lot of nastiness. I got this target on my back with, with the felony, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to be a part of any of that. I know I know it had a lot of negative, of course. That's why you're no longer on it. But give give us one really yeah, cool. Friend of mine told me, I have a good friend of mine, and um, he said, Mom, you know, he repeated back something that his mom had said about me. I said, wait, I thought your mom liked me. And he said, yeah, before you did that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's been one really cool thing that came out of Southern Charm for you? Well, yeah, I had two kids out of it. Okay, that's pretty good. I think the, 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 the funniest person that's ever been on that show is my father. He was hilarious, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you saw any of the episodes. He was there. He never even watched it though, and he would tell everybody he lives in a at the Frankie home, and they and then everyone there watched it, and he would say, "Yeah, I love the show." Love and they go, "Well," and then my stepmother pointed out, "Well, you've never even seen it. How can you like it?" Well, I want my children to do well, and here he does well, so therefore I like it. But um, he was hilarious, you know, about it. You know, in fact, I remember they filmed me and him doing a tete a tete in his office. And there was a life-size picture of Robert E. Lee, and one of these Yankee ladies tapped me on, tapped him on the shoulder, and said, "Mr. Robert, who is that?" And there's a picture of Robert E. Lee, and he goes, "Oh, that's Donald Trump's grandfather." <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, man, what a uh, what a show! And I did tune in a few times, but g- give me a little credit, I didn't watch every episode, but I know a lot of people did he when you were on. Always- cracking out and give me like for example he goes how the kids doing and one time and i said 
great. But there, with the mom this weekend, I said, no matter how you, lo- how much you love your kids, it's good to get a break. And, and I'll never forget his quick rejoinder at age 92. He goes, well, when are we going to get a break from you? <laughs> I was like, Jesus, on national TV here. Thomas, as we wrap up with you, I want to ask you, what is your connection with the Citadel? How much are you involved with the Citadel? What the Citadel means to you? You know, I hadn't really thought about that in a long time, but, you know, I just see the way I am, and I think that the connections, um, the ties, the contacts I've made, and the effect that it's had on me is – get stronger as I grow old I can see myself doing a lot of things and I'm and I'm realizing I'm doing this because at the Citadel I just remember like somebody you know meet the press and and those guys with the white gloves they find some dust and they you know smudge it on my you know and that's why I'm such a perfectionist you know in business and and building plans because I'm always someone said you're always looking for what's wrong I said you know you're never looking at what's right and I'm like because it should all be right everything let's look for what's wrong that's what they did at the citadel and they taught perfection and you know when you're doing a project as a developer you know you look at a mile down the road and you're looking for uh red flags or potentials uh potential for um issues but as a developer they they never become issues because you deal with them way in advance and i think that and and being very orderly and being neat because I, you know, I tell people messy people spend a lot more time than people that are clean because they spend out their time looking for stuff you know if you just take and, and clean up after yourself as you go and put things back where they belong you know where everything is it's just a better way to live and and I, and I have to attribute those attributes to having gone to the citadel although for many years I never appreciated it I was too resentful because, you know, it contradicted everything that I was looking for from a college experience. But later, I, I've grown to really appreciate what it did teach me. Mm-hmm. Although at the time, for many years, I was not cognizant of it. Well, one thing the school there on the Ashley River teaches is perseverance. And we all have our ups and downs in life. You've had some downs that have been well publicized, but the Citadel teaches you not to give up. And, and you've been able to do that. And there's a new chapter of Thomas Ravenel. You've got the three kids, as you mentioned. You're going to be moving to Aiken County, maybe putting in a little polo action there in the hills of Aiken My County. My house is 100 yards away from the oldest polo field in America, Aiken Polo Club. <laughs> I'm literally 100 yards away from There are 70 polo fields in Aiken. There are only maybe two in Charleston, one of which was my own. But there's no polo here. It's just a big waste of money. So I sold that property but um i love polo and here is costing thousands of dollars up there you you play free every day and uh it's just a play polo is a place to be well we'll look forward to catching up with you again maybe at a polo ground near you maybe you could bring a competitive polo program to the citadel that'd be something else but thomas we thank you for taking so much time to talk to us again it's class of 1985 and we wish you all the best, and it's been a real treat and honor to talk to you, sir. Congratulations. It's been a joy, privilege, and a pleasure, and I'm so happy to have done this. Thank you so much, John. All right, Thomas Ravenel, Citadel Class of 1985. Now, let's move on over to talk a little Citadel Sports. And moving along on today's show, we want to remind you that the Citadel Carolina is presented in part by IPS Packaging and Automation, a name you can certainly trust since 1976. IPS Packaging and Automation has been providing manufacturers and e-commerce companies with the very best packaging products and automation in the entire industry. IPS has a complete line of packaging products, stretch films, 3M tapes, corrugated boxes, strapping, and automation. IPS Packaging, based in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. They will analyze and streamline your current methods to improve your packaging process. Give them a call. Simple to do. 800-277-7007. Learn all about them. Visit them on the web at ipac.com. IPS Packaging and Automation. Derek Marduk and Company, a proud supporter of Citadel athletics and we're back here on the gray line and we've got this guy right here with us now jeff hartzell charleston post and courier and jeff following the great thomas ravenel hate you missed out on that fun jeff 
I'm sorry I missed that. I would like to hear what Thomas is up to these days. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. It's very simple for Jeff and anybody else out there to go back and watch and or listen to interviews like Mr. Ravenel or any of the great interviews we've done on this, our 301st episode of Citadel Grey Line. All you got to do, Jeff, I know you kind of are a celebrity there in the Hartzell household these days because not only are you found in iTunes, but you also can be found on YouTube. So all people have to do is simply go to YouTube and search for Citadel Grey Line and you'll see for the last couple of years all of our video editions of this show will pop up and you can watch it or you can go to iTunes and listen to Citadel Grey Line each week. So yeah, Jeff, we make it so easy for you or anybody else to kind of catch up. John, you are the king of all media. I don't know about that. I'm, I, I try to be a B plus at everything I do. Maybe I just need to be an A at one thing. I don't know, Jeff. But speaking of making grades, how about that Citadel football team with an A-plus effort in the fourth quarter, as Brent Thompson said at the conclusion of the game? And I love it, Jeff. We ain't dead yet. A dramatic come from behind, turning the tables, as the Citadel's kind of been on the bad end of these close games of late. But they get the victory at Gibbs Stadium against those Wofford Terriers. And I'm missing Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hello. Coming in. Are you there, Jeff? I am. Okay. I'm sorry. We cut out for a second. I was talking about the great comeback in Spartanburg. Yeah. How about that? In all my years covering the Citadel, I don't know if there's ever been a Bulldogs team that needed a victory more (laughs) than this one on Saturday. And, uh, you know, it was 24 to 7 there in the third quarter. And uh, I think a lot of Citadel fans were like, here we go again. But they, uh, the defense really rose up. Uh, four straight stops there in the second half. Uh, interception by Javante Middleton really kind of started everything rolling in the right direction. And then they forced a couple of punts and then forced a fumble. Carson Hatchett, uh, the fine freshman defensive lineman, forced a fumble. And the offense was able to convert those into scores. And uh, they left themselves just enough time, uh, about five minutes, for that final uh, game-winning drive and uh, what a scene it was in the locker room snapping an 11 game losing streak winning for the first time in 518 days since November 2nd 2019 so a much needed victory uh, and I think it cast a whole new light on these final two games against Firmer, Furman and VMI and uh, you know VMI lost last week their first loss Furman's offense is really struggling so uh you know these last two games are 28 24 the bulldogs get the victory a great win a humiliating loss for those terriers so humiliating <laughs> by the way jeff they decide to cancel the season after this game well i don't know if that was the reason uh you know, oh they that's had the off- reason they had an offensive lineman break his leg during the game and the same thing happened to chattanooga they had a starting offensive lineman break his leg, and then they opted out of the season. Wofford did the same thing on Monday. I think the coaches see these injuries pile up, and who's to say if the Citadel suffered an injury like that, they might call it pull the plug too. So, uh, But, yeah, two SOCON teams now, Wofford and Chattanooga, have pulled the plug, and you see teams from other parts of the country are calling it quits on this spring season as well. So uh, the rest of the season, uh, Citadel fans can take some satisfaction in the fact they stuck it out and did what they said they were going to do. Uh, if if a serious injury or two were to crop up uh, against Furman, maybe they would think twice about that. But uh, so far, they're on track to finish the season. And as we said, the victory over Wofford sort of cast a new light on these final two games uh, that maybe the Citadel can uh, – can finish strong and finish three and five in the SOCON spring. And after everything they've been through, that wouldn't be too bad. And speaking of injuries, it was good to see that the Citadel's defensive playmaker was back in the lineup after being out a couple of weeks. Jeff, as far as you know, is the Citadel right now, as we speak, doing pretty well on the injury front? Well, what a difference having Willie Eubanks, the third back at linebacker, and along with Anthony Britton who had missed the previous game as well. Uh, They each had 12 tackles against Wofford and were a big part 
of how the why the defense did as well as it did, especially in the second half. Unfortunately, uh, Dalton Owens, the all SoCon defensive tackle, suffered an injury during the game. I don't know exactly what that was, but he will likely not play against Furman this weekend. So uh, they'll be without Dalton. He's missed a, a, a earlier game due to suspension. And uh, they have a player, Bradley Peary, and, and I don't have his size right in front of me, but he's huge. And and he's a uh, nose tackle? I get a chance to play this week. Is Peary a he's nose tackle? He's a defensive tackle. tackle. Yeah, and I, I think they can switch. Yeah, I think he's, he's the a defensive one that'll... tackle. Uh, I think. Go ahead. He had a good game in the spring game, if you might recall. And uh, he, Coach Thompson says he just needs to be a little more consistent in his uh, production. And so uh, he'll get a chance to play uh, this week against Furman. He's and really I think huge. I'm right on this, Jeff. He's the one that on the final offensive play for Wofford got the sack and really got a fumble on that last play. I think I'm right on that. No, I don't think that was Peary. I think that was Andrew Lewis. Okay. Uh, if I recall. But, yeah, that was a great play as well. Yeah, the ball just kind of fell in his lap. And I don't think they called it a fumble, but it should have been. The, the no. ball went right into his No, no. Okay. And it was really good to see Javante Middleton uh, come up with that key interception and a, and a long return as well. You know, you know, he had to switch from quarterback to cornerback, and that's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, I don't know how much he defense he played in high school, but it can't be easy to go from uh, running the team to, to covering receivers and making tackles. So uh, I think he's improving every week. And as Brent Thompson often said, this will all pay off in the fall. And uh, I, uh, I know Citadel fans hope that's what happens. Well, the Citadel's in-state rival, longtime SOCON rival, comes to Johnson Aga this weekend. It's Furman. It's going to be a 1 o'clock kick at Johnson Aga Stadium in the final home game of the spring season. Furman comes in after a tough loss on the road. They lost to Mercer. So what do we know about what's going on with Furman also having not the greatest of years in Greenville? No, Furman is 3-3 three and three, uh, right now, and they've lost, they've lost their last two. As you mentioned, the Mercer game, I watched the end of that game, and Mercer totally dominated the, uh, the fourth quarter of that game. Furman's offense is really struggling. Uh, I think they've scored maybe 14, 13, 14, and 18 points in their last three games, something like that. So really struggling to move the ball and to score. So uh, I think, uh, you know, if the Citadel can play uh, the way they did against Wofford, I think they have a chance. Uh, you know, we can't forget they still fell behind 24-7. to 7. So they haven't solved uh, their slow starts yet, although the start against Wofford was much better than what we've seen in previous games. But they still fell behind 24-7. to 7. They had fourth – fourth and one in Wofford territory twice in the first quarter at the 23 yard line, both times and did not convert. So got to get a little bit better on, uh, on those fourth downs uh, or they could have, they could have taken an early lead against Wofford if they converted those two fourth downs. So still some things to work on. One thing that in this Wofford game, at least Jeff, that was a real pleasant surprise, especially as the game wore on, was the opening up the middle with the Citadel. I think Storch had a long run. He ended up fumbling. But then I think Harris had a very long run also. So that, that B-back position was able to plow right through the middle late in the game, and that really made a difference. Yeah, it's been a while since we've seen that. We used to see that a lot when Tyler Renew was playing fullback and, and previous fullbacks as well, where the, the middle would just open up. And I, I remember over the years, Wofford doing that many times to the Citadel with their be back. Uh, so it was good to see. Uh, and that means the offensive line is doing a good job. Hayden Haas was back at center after missing a game. Uh, obviously that made a big difference. Uh, and uh, Ben Brockington was back at tackle. So they really, their offensive line was about as whole as it's been uh, this season. And also the defense was about as complete as far as personnel goes as it's been this season, Anthony Britton back. So uh, not sure who's going to be out this week against Furman. That's always a, a game day reveal. Uh, but uh, they are they are closing in on completing all these bookstore suspensions and uh, with Furman and VMI still to play. All right, Jeff, anything else football before we move on to other sports? 
I don't think so. Uh, uh, should be a good one. The final home game of the year, of the spring, against Furman. And Coach Thompson's talked on his Monday presser about how they're going to approach uh, the spring, uh, the uh, summer. Basically, summer workouts will, will be cut in half uh, as to what they normally are to give this both the staff and, and the players a break after what's been a stressful spring. So, um, and then before you know it, it'll be September and time for fall football. All right. One, one scheduling, one scheduling note. I don't know if we've covered here. They're going to play North Greenville in the fall instead of South Carolina state, the home and home with South Carolina state will be moved delayed a year, at least a year. So they had to find a game to fill in for that. And uh, they're going to play North Greenville, a team they played a couple years ago. And that will be in Charleston? That will be in Charleston. Okay. The one from a few oh, years ago also was supposed to be in Charleston, but ended up being played at North Greenville of all places because of the hurricane. All right, Jeff That's Hartzell I- at Jeff underscore from the Post and Courier is the way you can find him on social media as we talk about all things Citadel Bulldog sports. And we have a lot of fun here on the program talking about El Cid. And we want to remind you that we still have our two knob knowledge questions. We've got a two-pack today, all involving the Citadel Wrestling Program, thanks to Thomas Ravenel. And those two questions are still out there ready to be answered. So if you happen to know the answers, there's the number, 843-779-8496. Text your answer. Okay, the two answers or two questions are all involving Citadel Wrestling. Tell me the two years that the Citadel has claimed the Southern Conference Championship. Tell me which two years those are. The second question is part of our two-pack, our throwdown wrestling two-pack here of knob knowledge questions presented in part by Big Red Palmetto Dot Store. Is tell me, Jeff. I'm going to ask you if you know it. Don't 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 you know don't spurt this out here. If you if you know it, just uh, hold on. But raise your hand in a second okay. if you actually know the answer. The Citadel has had four All-American wrestlers. Two of these wrestlers have been from one country and two have been from another country. If you can tell me which two countries those wrestlers at the Citadel are from, you'll win a $25 gift certificate from Big Red Palmetto Dot Store. All you have to do, 843-779-8496. Hurry up, though, because we've got to get this trivia question answered before we get out of here. So, Jeff, do you happen to know which two countries, don't, don't say it, uh, those wrestlers are from. I think I do. Okay, Jeff Hartzell. Uh, they need Citadel Wrestling needs to reestablish that connection. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that country sent some good wrestlers to the Citadel. And maybe both countries they could reestablish connections with here. All right, Jeff. Let's move on to Citadel baseball. This past weekend, Mercer was the opponent, and we're going to get your report on that. And what else is going on with Tony Skull's program? Well, uh, last night uh, they. They played a game against rival College of Charleston, and I think it kind of sums up where Citadel baseball is right now. They outhit the Cougars. The Cougars made four errors, and College of Charleston won the game. Six was it five to four? Or six. I think to they five won in the ninth inning, right? Right. They won on a walk, two wild pitches, and an infield single in the mm-hmm. ninth. So the Citadel has out now lost nine straight games. So things not going well for Tony Skoll and and the Bulldogs at the moment. And as we've mentioned several, you know, they out hit the Cougars last night, eight to six. Uh, And the Cougars committed four errors and still won the game. Uh, So um, the Citadel is hitting the ball better than recent Citadel teams have, but they're not pitching the ball as well as Citadel tradition would uh, require. So um, they got to, you know, Time's running out on the SoCon season, and if they're going to make a move, now is the time. Now is the time. Right now, Tony Skull's program is really, really struggling on the diamond, and we wish them all the best as they try to get a little bit of redemption here as the schedule winds down, as you said. Right now, 8-16 and 16 overall is their record, only 1-7 and seven in conference play for the Bulldogs. As we said, Mercer was the opponent this past weekend, and the Bears came in to Joe Riley Park, Jeff, and swept away the Citadel baseball team. The series went like this, 12-2 to in that first game on Friday, and then on Saturday the Dogs lose 6-5 to and lose in 
the second game of Saturday, the last game of the series, 12-2 to two to the Bears from Macon, Georgia. And again, let me repeat, the Bulldogs' SoCon record right now, 1-7 and seven on a nine-game losing streak. Yeah, not good right now. Uh, so uh, we'll see if they can get it cleaned up. They play College of Charleston a couple more times this year. I think they have at least one more game with South Carolina on the schedule. So uh, uh, time to get going for the Bulldogs. Yeah, this weekend, El Cid will be playing more Southern Conference action. They'll be in Birmingham in the Magic City to take on the Sanford Bulldogs. Again, a Friday game followed by a doubleheader on Saturday. The Citadel will next be home for a Southern Conference series with ETSU the weekend of April 16th, 17th. So that's what's happening there with Tony Skull's program. Jeff, what else Citadel athletics-wise can you report on today? Well, uh, the Citadel volleyball team wrapped up uh, a pretty successful season, and uh, Charlissa de Jesus was named the SOCON Volleyball Player of the Month on the offense. I guess they name an offensive player and a defensive player. She was named the Offensive Player of the Month. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, the SOCON Volleyball Tournament was cut to four, just four teams this year so the citadel narrowly missed out on making the socon tournament but it was uh probably the most successful season in citadel volleyball history and you remember that great win over college of charleston where they snapped a long long losing streak against the cougars so kudos to citadel volleyball yes and i believe miss this de jesus i believe is her last name is a native of puerto rico so another yes a, a place that we might could find great citadel talent. I think we had a basketball player from there a couple of years ago. Does that sound familiar? We did. Yep. All right, Jeff, you are not in your typical situation. It is Masters Week, so don't tell me that if you walk outside right now, you'll see the 18th Creed in Augusta. No, no. <laughs> I might see some, I might see some water if I walk outside. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we appreciate you coming on and, and filing your report. And, again, it's Jeff Hartzell at Jeff underscore from the PC is how you can find him on social media, the Post and Courier, the beat writer for the Citadel. And, again, appreciate everything. And we'll look forward to getting your recap of what happened with Furman and getting us ready for the closer on the spring football season at VMI next week. Everybody, Jeff Hartzell. Thanks, John. Have a good week. All right. Thank you. And, uh, by the way, speaking of the Masters, who you got for uh, winner this week? You know, I'd like to see Jordan Spieth do well. You know, okay. he's had such a struggle getting his game back, and he won last week, and he's had some success and heartbreak at Augusta. So I think I'd like to see him do well. All right. Well, Jeff, I'm going to go, not that you asked, but uh, I'm going to put my name up. J-O-N-R-A-W-L is my last name. But there's a golfer with a name almost identical to mine, and I've actually met him before, and he just became a father. So who am I going with, Jeff? John Rom. John Rom, the Spaniard, the Arizona State Sun Devil. Yes, he has a chance a, to do quite well this weekend. But there's another fine golfer who has your name. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Isabella actually Isabella Ball. Yeah. Maybe one day she'll get to play in the Augusta women's tournament. Wouldn't I'm really surprised she wasn't in it this year. I'm not aware of any native South Carolinians that participated in the Augusta National Women's Amateur. However, did you see, Jeff, that the University of South Carolina, to their credit, had as many golfers in that thing as any other college in the in the country. I think it was USC and Stanford, the other USC, and the Gamecocks had, I think, four women's players in that uh, Augusta Amateur. Four. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's great to see the women get to play that, that beautiful course. And one of these days we'll get a Citadel Bulldog golfer out there at the Augusta Women's National – Augusta – National Women's Amateur. Yeah, I have to get it right. But, yeah, good time here in the uh, this part of the South where we have Augusta. It's a definite sign that spring is here. Thank you, Jeff. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you, John. All right. And that will wrap up our show here with Citadel Grand Line. Again, thanks again to Mr. Ravenel, class of 1985, for appearing on the show. And thank you for appearing with us here as we do this each and every week during football season, whether that's in the fall or in the spring. Thanks for tuning in. Citadel Gray Line, a production of CRN Sports. Fall out, y'all.